Christians we have met to worship and adore the living God. Will you pray with all your power while we try to preach the word? All is vain unless the Spirit of the Holy One comes down. Christians pray and holy manna will be showered all around. Is there here a trembling jailer seeking grace and filled with fears? Is there here a weeping Mary pouring forth a of tears, tell them all about the Savior, how in Christ the lost are found. Pray, oh pray, and holy manna will be scattered all around. Let us love our God supremely. Let us love each other too. Let us pray for all earth's people till our God makes all things new. Christ will call us home to heaven. At the table we'll sit down. Christ will welcome us and serve us, living manna all around. And please join me in the responsive reading. Beautiful are the works of God. Beautiful also are the skins of God's people. Beautiful is the mind of God. Beautiful also are the hopes of God's people. Beautiful is the heart of God. Beautiful also are the souls of God's people. God made the heavens and the earth. To God be the glory for the things God has done. Let us pray. God, we continue to rejoice in Christ's victory over death, but we do not always feel victorious. Through our worship today, refresh our souls. Help us to grow in faith and trust in the power you provide through Christ to defeat the threat of sin and slander. Give us joy of victory and renewed belief in your Son's triumph. Enliven our passion to share the good news and kind words with others. Through Christ we pray, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning. So for today's children's message, we are going to be talking about Mother's Day. Uh, big surprise, right? So on Mother's Day, what are, what are some things that we normally do to show our mom that we, that we love her on Mother's Day? So we can either, I mean, some people make breakfast in bed. Some people go make or buy 
some nice presents. Um, some people get cards. Maybe you're a little more artistic. You can make a card. So one I have here says, Mom, how could I ever repay you for all you've done? Now, I'm not going to show you the inside because my mom might be watching and I need to save the surprise. So we'll just sit on that for a little bit. So to, I, I think it, it's really nice that we, that we spend Mother's Day and we, and we can show and tell our moms how much we love them. But now hear me out here. I've never been a mom, so I don't know for sure. But I bet you moms would like it if we would show and say how much we love them every other day, right? So what are, some, what are some ways we can do that? We can maybe clean our rooms, or we can help with the dishes or take out the garbage, right? And this, this one might get a little crazy, you might not believe me here, but you could get along with your brothers and sisters. I know it's, it's crazy, but you can do it. I know you can. Now, do you think, do you think that God likes when we, come, when we come to church on Sundays, do you think God likes that? Absolutely, right? We come and we, and we show our praise, we show our thanks for God on Sundays, and that's great. But again, I think that God would be pretty happy if we could find ways to show that we love him every other day, too, not just on Sundays or not just on special holidays, right? And I think the best way that we can show God how much we love him is by loving everyone else around him, around us, right? So just like our friends and our family, we can, we can love them, the person at school who we might not get along with all the time, we can show love to them. Our brothers and sisters, when they're being really annoying, we can love them, right? I think those are all ways that we can show that we love God. So, yeah, Mother's Day is really nice, and it's, and it's really cool to, to show our moms how much we love them on Mother's Day. But it's really important to show our moms every other day how much they mean to us. And, yeah, Sundays, Sundays are really great. They're, they're good to, to come to church and to show God how much we love them. But again, it is really important that we show God every other day how much we love him. Does that sound good? All right, so let's go ahead and fold our hands, bow our heads, and we'll repeat after me, okay? Dear God, we join together today to say I love you. Help us when we leave here to show you our love with our actions. Amen. Let us go before our Lord in prayer. Eternal God, we thank you for Jesus who brought hope to the distressed, promise to the despairing, and healing to the afflicted. In him there is a gift of eternal life to all who believe. We thank you for your Holy Spirit who calls us to labor, as Christ is the vine, you name us as the branches and send us to bear much fruit. 
Let love lead us to be more forgiving and to add and add to love the discipline to be a reconciling force in the world, especially in our own homes. When enemies taunt us, assure us of your presence as we seek patience and inner strength. Amid tensions caused by misunderstanding, suspicion, or lack of trust, send your spirit of insight and hope. Help us make the first move towards those we have offended, forsaking our pride and seeking peace. Let love lead us to be more daring, giving boldness to speak on behalf of the voiceless, Let us not be afraid to venture into dark places or into situations in which we are not in control. Fill us with confidence that you will not desert us, the assurance that what we do is in accord with your will. Keep us from becoming frustrated by the many faces of evil. Set our sights on what we have already overcome by the blood of Christ and the word of our witness. Let our testimony and proclamations reveal that truth. Let love lead us to give thanks for those who show kindness without thought of their own gain, our mothers and mother figures. They are the saints of Christ's household who glide gracefully from task to task. Bestow upon them a measure of strength to match their diligence. Reward them with a sense of accomplishment equal to their level of patience. Forbid, O God, that we should ever take them for granted. We pray for all family members who seek to walk humbly with you. Help us to support one another in the quest to live simply and guide us to speak the many, many blessings you give us. Through Christ we pray. Amen. Our theme in worship today is words, and in particular, how powerful our words can be. Granted, our words can do damage and compromise the sense of community that we have with one another, but our words also have the potential to have an extraordinarily positively powerful impact. And God intends that our words enhance and build up and strengthen the communities around us. In fact, anything that does that, anything that promotes life, enhances life, strengthens life, is pleasing to God. 1 Corinthians 12 says that God has given us each a spiritual gift, quote, for the building up of the common good. So anything that builds up our common good is pleasing to God. And so it is with the offerings we give. Every act of generosity is like an encouraging word that is spoken. It serves to strengthen our connection with and to each other. Now, in addition to our regular online giving, which you can access by going to our website, cccdisciples.org, and then looking for the word give in the upper right-hand corner and following prompts, we have a new uh, feature that we've added to that uh, online giving capability this week, and that is text to give. Our church now has its own text to give number which is 217-212-2173. I've saved it to my contacts. You can do the same thing if you wish. But uh, simply type give to that number, and the first time you'll do that, you'll have to register some personal information. Every time after that, it's easy, quick, safe, secure, and it's an instant way you can give to Central. But regardless of how, when, and in what capacity you give, we thank you for your expressions of generosity and for the way that they build up our common good of which we are part.
I invite you to pray with me. Gracious God, we give you thanks that you give us the ability to speak words. We give you greater thanks that you are the word that gives us life, that saves us, and that guides us through life. We pray as we gather around your word with our words this morning that the words of my mouth and all of our thoughts and prayers are pleasing to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Our sermon today is week three of a five-week sermon series called Hope in These Times. It is based on answers to questions that I emailed out to you, the church, several weeks ago about how you are experiencing this pandemic. And we're taking your responses and pairing them with a reading each week from the letter of James, which is all about living out our faith in action, as David Martin's message to the children was, showing our love and our action, for example, as he said on Mother's Day, but we, we, we believe that when we, when we look at that our responses and, and, and how they line up with the readings from the letter of James, we see that there's, even though there's great uncertainty around us, there is much, much to be hopeful for in our time today. One of the questions that I asked of you as you were experiencing this pandemic was, what are you learning about yourself? What are we learning about ourselves during this time that we're living in? And one person responded this way. They said, I'm learning that I really do love my family. It may seem obvious, but what they went on to say was, this time of being in shelter in place has given us as a family the opportunity to do things that with our busy schedules we weren't taking the, the advantage or having the opportunity to do, like sit down and have dinner together at the table every night. And in doing that, I find that I really do care about these people that God has put into my life, and, and I'm, I'm grateful that the pandemic has, has allowed me to, to see that. I, I thought it was a wonderful response and hope that you can, re, that it resonates with you and you have similar types of experiences. Yet at the same time, somebody else responded this way. They said, I'm learning just how much when I'm tired and cranky and stressed, I can say words that are not the nicest. Someone else was, had a similar response and, 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 and said that once a word is spoken, it can't be unspoken. They compared it to putting toothpaste back into a tube. You can't do that without making a mess once it's squeezed out of the tube. And so this, this person said, I'm learning that I want to be more intentional about the words I speak so I don't hurt the ones that I care about the most. And I found that th those responses to that question very fitting with the letter of James because right in the middle of his letter, he devotes a whole bunch of energy and attention to the words we speak and how in particular our words have the power to, to do great damage to the sense of community that we have. James is writing these words to the church, to the, to the people who are forming a Christian community, and he's showing them that words have the power to tear apart the fabric of community that we have with one another. And we probably can relate to that by our own experiences. How many times have you been tempted maybe to get the last word in in a conversation or a back and forth or even an argument? You know, even though, even though you know that saying that last word is going to touch a nerve or hit a sore spot, we just can't help ourselves from saying it. Paul says in Romans 7, he says, the very thing that I don't want to do, I find myself doing. And it's that way maybe sometimes with our words. Getting the last word in, having that last sentence spoken it may give us a momentary feeling of superiority, but really in the long run, it can have a, a, a long-lasting negative impact. Words are powerful. Words have the power to be remembered. And, and that can, can sometimes be detrimental to a relationship. In couples counseling, we talk about the danger of using you messages, as in Y-O-U. 
you messages. You messages are ones that are spoken where Y-O-U, you, is the, are, are the focus. And they sound something like this. You've probably heard them uh, or spoken them. You are always late. You never do such and such. What am I going to do with you when you do this? You are not parenting the right way. You see that. You hear that. You, the emphasis on you. Now, you messages never go over well. They're almost guaranteed to get a pushback. Well, you do such and such. Well, that's because you do this. Well, I do this because you do that. And so on. And we're trapped in this cycle of you back and forth. Now, the real problem with a you message is that when, when I speak a you message, I'm putting you in a permanent villain box. And if you're the villain, then I am the hero. And, and worse than, if there's going to be any progress in that relationship, the work of responsibility is always on the villain, the one who is the you, where the hero gets off without having to do any of the work. See, words are powerful. They have the, the ability to shape reality, even distort reality, in a way that's convenient for us, the subject. If I tell myself something enough times, it starts to become a narrative that plays on repeat in my mind. And the more that plays on repeat, the more I'm likely to believe it. And once I believe it, I will see it to be true everywhere. If I tell myself that you are such and such, then I will eventually see you as such and such in everything you do. And words are powerful. They have the, the ability to shape reality. They also have the, the power, the ability of preventing us from dealing with things that are uncomfortable for us. Anything, a narrative that doesn't square with the convenient narrative that I'm telling myself, we can hide behind our words and not have to deal with that. In World War II, for example, we used words like temporary relocation camps instead of calling them places of enforced imprisonment for reasons of race and ethnicity. Right? But saying something like a temporary relocation camp, well, that doesn't sound as bad. It's, it's sanitized. It's cleaner. After all, our children temporarily relocate to camp in the summertime when they go away from us for a little bit. Or consider the, the, the provocative phrase ethnic cleansing. When we use a phrase like ethnic cleansing, we don't have to think about mass murder. We don't have to think about the loss of lives of many, many innocent people. In fact, ethnic cleansing sounds almost beneficial. Uh, it has the word clean in it, and who doesn't want to be clean? You see, words have the power to shape reality in a way that's convenient for us and, and from preventing us from dealing with things that are uncomfortable to the, to the way that we want to see reality. Words also have the power to shape identity. Hannah Arendt was a German-Jewish philosopher who lived in the 20th century. She lived through the, the Nazi regime. She wrote a, a piece in the, called On Totalitarianism in which she said very wisely that what defines us as people are two things. First is a body, a physical body that inhabits this physical world. And secondly, what defines us is a name. You have a name. I have a name. We all have names. And that name represents everything the body is not. It represents our essence, our identity, the, the core characteristic of who we are. And then she said that what totalitarianism did and what it does is it takes away the name and she said, one, and, and it replaces it with a number or a label or a category or a stereotype. And she said, once, once we take away the name, then we can do whatever we want to the body because the person is no longer there and the body could even be discarded. That's why Joseph Stalin said famously that the death of one person is a, is a tragedy. The death of a million people is a statistic. You see, words are powerful. Words, with our words, we name things. And with our names, with our words, we give things identities. And so we should take very seriously the names we use about ourselves and about one another. And it's not a matter of political correctness. 
It's about respecting and dignifying the identities that exist. So, for example, if I say to you, my name is Michael Edwin Karunas. Those are my names given to me that represent the core of who I am. And if I say to you, I prefer to be called Michael. And if you say to me, well, that's great, but I'm going to call you Mikey. You are attempting to give me an identity that I'm not choosing for myself. And moreover, you are exerting power over me. And when you exert power over me, you are dehumanizing the me that is here. And the more we dehumanize with our words and our names, the more distance we create between us and others. And then this is the worst thing about it all, is that we, even though both of us are created in the likeness of God, we fail to see our likeness with each other. Yeah, words are powerful. Words have great and lasting impact. And did you know that the letter of James, James is right on with this topic. Right in the middle of his letter, James chapter 3, he speaks about the power of words. And that's our reading today. So here, if you want to read along with me, you certainly may. This is James chapter 3, verse 1 through 12. And, and, and here's what James says. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers and sisters, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For all of us make many mistakes. Anyone who makes no mistakes in speaking is perfect, able to keep the whole body in check with a bridle. But if we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we guide their whole bodies. Or look at ships. Though they are so large that it takes strong winds to drive them, yet they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also is the tongue a small member, yet it boasts of great exploits. How great a forest is set ablaze by a small fire. And the tongue is a fire. The tongue is placed among our bodies as a world of iniquity. It stains the whole body, sets on fire the cycle of nature, and is itself set on fire by hell. For every species of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature, can be tamed and has been tamed by the human species. But no one can tame the tongue, a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it... We bless the Lord and Father, and with it we curse those who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and brackish water? Can a fig tree, my brothers and sisters, yield olives or a grapevine figs? No more can salt water yield fresh. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. James is right on there, pretty harsh with his treatment of our words. You see, for James, he says quite clearly, nobody in speaking is perfect. We all make mistakes, meaning that we all of us, we all of us with our words can do damaging things, yet we will be held accountable for our words, all of us. And so the more we speak and the louder we speak, the more we teach, say, or the more we preach, here I am preaching, the more careful we need to be with our words. That's probably why in James chapter 1 he prefaced all of this by saying, be slow to speak and quick to listen. Words can have a great influence. And the way that he describes the influence is, is very creative. He compares our tongue, which with which we speak, he says the tongue is a small part of the human body, yet it has great influence. He compares it to a bit in a horse's mouth. That small piece of metal can make this strong, mighty animal go in any direction. Or it's like a rudder of a ship. A small, relatively small piece of equipment on the ship can guide the whole vessel. Or it's a single match, a single spark that sets on fire an entire forest. He even goes a step further. Did you notice he called the tongue, the, the words we speak, the tongue is, is full of deadly poison set on fire by the, uh, the flames of hell. So why would he say that? The answer is really in verse 9. He says, with our words, with the same mouth, 
We bless the Lord our God and we curse our neighbor made in the image of God. That's the crux of the matter. Remember for James, he said that last week that the command to love our neighbor is the royal law of Scripture. And it is the foundation and the cornerstone of the church. So remember, he is talking to the church about what gives the church, the community of faith, its identity. And he says that has to be love of neighbor, kindness, respect, dignity to one another. And the worst thing that we can do to that sense of community is to curse our neighbor. Because to curse our neighbor is to fail to see the image of God in them, which is really to fail to see the image of God in ourselves even though we just don't recognize that. So I suppose, I suppose that in a time of shelter in place, when we do get tired and we do get cranky, it's not surprising that we, with our words, would say things that weren't the nicest or that would actually hurt the people we care about the most. So what do we do? Where's our hope in all of this? Well, our hope comes from this truth that even amid all of these human words that can do damage and disrupt and sow discord, we all stand under the Word of God. And the Word of God, this powerful Word of God, always and in every case gives life, it creates life, it saves life, and it guides and directs through life. Scripture says that God created the world into existence through a Word. Genesis 1 says, God spoke into the darkness, let there be light, and there was light. Before God spoke, there was darkness, but only when God spoke a word did light exist. God's word gives life, creates, enhances, builds up life around us. And that same word also saves us. Jesus Christ, the manifestation of God on earth in human form, was called a word. In Greek, the logos. Not just the logos, he was the pre-existent logos that existed before anything else, without whom nothing came into being. John 1.1, 1, 1, you've heard it before, say it along with me. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Before Jesus was a teacher, a healer, a miracle worker, before he liberated, before he, he, he uh, uh, brought together or transformed, before he was a suffering servant or a Messiah in any way, he was a word. By the word of God we are saved. And the word of God that gives life and, and saves life also is meant to direct us through life. Psalm 119 verse 105 says that the word of God, the word of God is a light unto our path and a lamp unto our feet. See, the word of God is meant to help us endure and and, and persevere through the struggles in life, not meant to add more burdens to us. The word of God is meant to help eliminate our self-doubt and our fear, not to give us more of it. And the Word of God is is meant to to show our connectedness and to build up our community, not break it apart. And so what gives me hope is another response that that you sent into my question about what are you learning about yourselves? Because someone sent in, they said, what gives me hope in this time is reading on social media, encouraging, uplifting, thoughtful, inspiring comments. Because there's so much opportunity on social media to be negative, and so these stand out as beacons of hope in the midst of that. And I agree, and I don't even have to get on social media to be reminded of that, though I do. These are two pictures, these last two pictures here for our sermon. And just hold them there for a minute, Donna, if you would, or Wayne. Just hold them there so people can see those. These are two pictures from my daughter's room. She's 15 years old, or almost 15 years old, and she's been doing this for the last several years. The first picture of it is is an interior shot of her room, and the the second one, I believe, is is the doorway to her room. And and she's been doing this for several years now. She had, and and, and her mother and I can take no credit for this at all, because this is all 100% on her own. But she has filled every square inch of her room every square inch of her wall space, every square inch of the front door to her room with affirming, 
encouraging, inspiring words. She has phrases like, speak up, speak out. Believe in yourself. Don't be afraid. See the child of God when you look in the mirror every day. She's got scriptures quoted about the promise of God, the power of God, the presence of God. And each one is meticulously handwritten in her own calligraphy on pieces of paper that she has pre-decorated in her own watercolor designs. It is as though, you see, she is going out of her way to surround herself with the powerfully positive word of God. And I believe that this is James' intention for us. Remember, he is writing to the church. What is the church? And yes, he wants us to know there is the potential and possibility because we are broken people living in a broken world to use our words to do harm. But by grace, the church is called to be that community of individuals and a community itself that is to speak and to surround the world with these life-giving, life-saving, life-guiding, life-sustaining, directing and supporting words of God. And when we do that as the church and individuals in the church, of the church, there is no way that we cannot find hope in these or any other times. Thanks be to God. This week, we asked you to gather some type of receptacle and a stone. And the reason we ask you to do that is because we are use meditative worship aids as a a physical representation of what we are um, committing to spiritually or a spiritual reality. And today, after hearing Pastor Michael talk, you might be feeling a little bit of a burden or convicted by words that you've said in the past that may not have been very uplifting. And you could be carrying other burdens with you, like Um, Maybe you're having financial trouble or there's an illness or a relationship that's strained. And these are things that you carry, but you don't need to carry those by yourself or at all, actually, because Scripture tells us to cast our burdens upon the Lord and He will sustain us and He will never let His righteous fall. So what that means is that we can cast our burdens on God, give them to God, lay them at His feet, and He will receive those from us. And he will carry those burdens with us. Another way that you could use this stone, you can use it as a representation of a burden. You can also use it as a representation of a promise. A promise that you are making to yourself and to God and to others that you will try and do better and maybe withhold your tongue or bridle your tongue a little bit more than you have in the past. And God will help you to do that as well. So when, you're, when we listen to our communion hymn and the meditation song, let's think of those things and use the stone as a release. So what we will do is we'll drop the stone into the receptacle. And when you do, that is a representation that you are leaving that burden or trusting God in the hope that he will help you carry on the promise. Leave those things with God. And let me encourage you, do not pick them back up when the service is over. Leave the burdens with God and he'll take them. Thanks. Jesus Christ, companion at this feast, 
I empty now my heart and stretch my hands and ask to meet you here in bread and wine which you lay down. As Pastor Don is moving his way to the communion table, This would be the time for you to get your communion elements. This table is open. All uh, who are viewing today are welcome to receive. If you don't have your elements, go ahead and get them now, but we will be partaking of them in a few moments. This morning's meditation was given to us by Gail Prince. And as I read this meditation, she also has uh, a few things that she would like you to observe. The one is her bi- the Bible of her mother, and the other is the folded hands in prayer of her mother. So, uh, Gail, I also wore this shirt and tie for you. <laughs> this is what Gail shares with us. When I knew that I was to give the meditation on Mother's Day during this time of isolation and uncertainty, it made me reflect on the strong mother I had. The first thing I thought of was my mom's Bible and a picture I took of her hands folded in her lap. This picture was taken near the end of her life when she was in a care facility She cherished her Bible and read it faithfully each day till her eyesight failed. Then she was introduced to the Bible on audio. My mom was raised in a poor family of eight, being the third oldest and caring for her siblings with a continuous job. She was married at age 18 and gave birth to me while my dad was serving in Germany during World War II. I can only imagine how afraid she must have been with a war going on and not knowing if my dad, the love of her life, would make it home. I was nine months old before my dad returned home. She was married 57 years and raised four children She instilled in each one of us her love for Jesus, and not so much with her words, but with her actions of always caring for others. Proverbs 1.8 tells us, Listen, my son, to your father's instructions, and do not forsake your mother's teaching. They will be a garland to grace your head and a chain to adorn your neck. May we reflect on the teachings of our mothers as we take of this bread and drink of this cup. May it remind us of the love we receive from our Lord and Savior today and always. And again, we believe that this is the table of Jesus Christ. It does not belong to us. We are merely the stewards. And so everyone who believes is invited to partake of their elements today. We remember always when we come around this table that the Lord Jesus, on the night in which his body was handed over by a word of betrayal, that he took a loaf of bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And how in the same way he took a cup after supper and when he given thanks, he gave it to them also and said, this cup is a new covenant shed for you in my blood for your sins and your salvation. Drink of this all of you in remembrance of me. Will you pray with me? God of love, send your Holy Spirit to be with us this day as we remember Jesus, your divine love in human form. May we by faith partake of this meal that Jesus prepares for us each time we come together at the table. As we rise from our places of worship, make us to be Christ's body in the life of the world. It is in his name we pray. Amen. We will partake of the bread with these words. The bread which we break is our communion in the body of Christ.
And the cup of blessing for which we give thanks is our communion in the blood of Christ. Amen. And now as we go forth, as you go forth into your week, as you go forth into the rest of the day, go surrounded by the life-giving, life-sustaining, life-saving Word of God. Go with the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the togetherness of the Holy Spirit. Go in peace. Amen. Let